What's up? What's up, y'all? I'm Andre Godala, being joined with my guy, Evan Turner. Make sure you follow us across all social platforms at Point Forward. On today's show, we will be discussing the outlook for the Masters this week, throughout the weekend, the drama swirling around the Timberwolves' ownership, and E.T. also sat down for an exclusive conversation with Heat rookie Jaime Jaquez Jr. Be sure to stay tuned for that. Point Forward. Point Forward is sponsored by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout our show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Point Forward. E.T. is Masters Week. You know, I'm super excited. Like you say, I've decided to uh, erase fun from my life. But I am excited about this week, the Masters and Liv and PGA Tour coming back together for the few times that they, they're in the same place at the same time. So now they're together four times a year. And so as we look into the DraftKings odds of the week are on the PGA Tour, the winners of probably the most prestigious tournament in golf. few names, Scotty Scheffler does have the best odds. He's been killing it this year. Scotty Scheffler is more of like a um, Tim Duncan. So he doesn't like to get a lot of praise, um, doesn't sell a lot of shoes, you know, doesn't sell a lot of product. You know, Tim Duncan was with Nike for a hot second, had some dope shoes, just couldn't sell them. Went to Adidas. Didn't really sell too much there. He's just, you know, he's just a silent killer. And so Scotty Scheffler keeps winning. Uh, he's the first player to, I think, ever defended the player championship, which is like the fifth major, like ever, to defend it. Nobody ever won it back to back, ever, ever. That's Not crazy. even Tiger Woods. Nobody ever did this. And uh, he mm-hmm. was able to do that to do that this year. They're number one in the world right now. And this dude Cole, but he just kind of has this boring, bland look to him. But Buddy Cole, like he hit the ball straight every time. And you go get it on the green, you're going to put it in. And, uh, yeah, so he's out outright uh, best odds at plus 450. Then it's Roy McIlroy. Um, we've compared Roy to different guys. That's your boy, Roy. Roy's KD. my guy. Yeah, Roy KD. Uh, he's at plus 1,000. Uh, John Rahm is a defending champ of the Masters. Uh, he's at plus 1,100. John Rahm is like, because he's a big boy, man. He's like 6'4", 240. He a big dude, man. Solid Spaniard, Spaniard, Spanish guy. Um, compare him to like, uh, cause he cold. He got it all, man. He he might be like MB or Giannis. MB, oh, Giannis. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. do an MB. I'll do an MB. Giannis. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, that yeah. nigga outside the top eight. John Rahm is like MB. Uh, super nice. Xander Shoffley is the fourth best odds, which is interesting. He hasn't. He's yet to win a major, but he got game. Up and comer. Super nice man. He's like Luca. He's like mm-hmm. Luca. His dad was a um like a physiotherapist, like early early Our age dad. physiotherapist back in the day, and so he like trained his body, his son's body movements, and had him strength training at a young age. Got him real nice, and so dude got crazy mm-hmm. game, crazy potential, still young. And then uh, Brooks Kepka yeah. rounds out the top Brooks. five. You know he was at uh he's with Live Golf too. Um, he's at plus two thousand. Has five majors, but he's never won. Um, he's never won at the Masters, but just still got a crazy track record. Brooks, that dude, just got crazy confidence, just nice with it. It's so funny. I saw. I think I saw a stat. I think I sent it to you the other day. It was like for 10 years straight, Tiger Woods had a 37% chance of winning a tournament. Yeah. And then like a 32% chance or something of finishing below ninth. Yes. And it was like for 10 years, he has a better chance of winning a tournament than falling outside the top 10 finish. And golf is insane. Yeah, so you compare that to who? Jordan, huh? Basically, because you knew, you knew MJ was going to the finals and you knew once he got there, he was going to win it. That was a crazy I, I, one, man. 10 years. MJ even took a break. Like, Tiger, yeah, yeah that was insane, man. Insane. Yeah, that's crazy. A few other Masters odds. Uh, big guns versus the field. Uh, the field is at a minus 250 and the big guns being... Sh- Scotty Scheffler, Roy McIlroy, and John Rahm at a plus 185. Uh, will there be an albatross is an interesting bet being made. Is that Would that be considered a prop bet? But uh, mm-hmm. an albatross is essentially um, on a par five mm-hmm. making your second shot, which on mm-hmm. the shortest hole, which is no two, two. The second hole, you can have like a six, seven mm-hmm. iron in. I'm assuming you can have a six iron in on two and, and then on eight, you can have a, them guys might have a four iron in, 
13, they could have a, they lengthened that. It's, it's that, that hole got changed. I think it might be the only hole that got changed at the Augusta. 13 might be, uh, it's a little longer now. You might have somebody with a five iron in, six iron in there. And then on 15, that's a tough shot too. I see it depending on pin placement. But those are crazy odds. I don't see anybody getting an albatross, but they have it as a bet at plus 1,200. Uh, the winner coming from the final grouping, that's a dope bet. They got bets on everything. Yes, at a minus 280, no at a plus 200. And then wire to wire winning, meaning somebody winning from the beginning to the end, leading from the first round all the way to being a champ is at a plus 700 for a yes. So, man, what we say, ET? Y'all make sure y'all get y'all some help. <laughs> y'all make it all these bets. Yeah, good luck, man. Or go with what you know, man. You said all these bets, man. I'm I'm still betting 100 on Tiger. Point forward. The NBA is in full swing, and when I can't get enough of the action on the court, I spice things up betting on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Right now, new customers bet 5 bucks and get $150 instantly in bonus bets. North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code POINT4. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code point four. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or West Virginia. Visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash bball for eligibility and deposit restriction terms and responsible gaming resources. On Thursday, Glenn Taylor, current owner of the Minnesota Timberwolves and Minnesota Lynx, announced that the window, his window, their window, depending on whose window, uh, Glenn Taylor's window apparently closed for Mark Gloria Alex Regress to uh, assume ownership of the franchise. Consequently, he says he intends to remain the majority owner of both basketball teams. Uh, very interesting news um, that has come from the North. I wouldn't say Northwest, the North. Um, I said it's the Midwest to us. Yeah, to us it is the Midwest. Yeah. It's been so much talk. We can't figure out what news is what, but it's been a very interesting last seven days in terms of the finishing the sale, the sale of the uh, most recent NBA team that was we thought was being bought. It's been in, it's <laughs> been on Lailway for, what, three years now? Yeah. Yeah. That- <laughs> Lay away for three years, which is crazy, bro. Well, it's interesting because that was how the process originally began, where you buy into the team, uh, Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez, A Rod. Um, they would buy up to up to a certain amount of the team. Uh, yeah, twenty twenty. I think they're buying. What was it? Twenty. Uh, twenty twenty. Twenty percent, twenty percent, and they're going to buy like the rest of the forty or forty or something to make a majority or something exactly. like that. Exactly, right? yeah. and they've been putting up the money. Uh, they've been up on target. Been at a lot of games, interacting with the players, and uh, the Timberwolves got good really fast. And they got a, a pick in Anthony Edwards, and it just changed the trajectory of the team. The, the price they bought the team at was one point five billion. I guess Glenn Taylor is saying today's price is not yesterday's price. And it's been so many stories out there. It's been really Inflation. interesting. Yes. <laughs> but I think a lot of people have been talking about it because it's it's really interesting. From Glenn Taylor, he says, under terms of the purchase agreement, the closing was required to occur within 90 days following the exercise notice issued by Lori and Rodriguez. The 90-day period expired on March 27th, 2024. His words. But it seems as if we are getting other word that A-Rod and Mark Lori, I mean, all this money and all, all this work, you know, they would just come up short. I don't think they were short. And it just feels like a classic game of spades in a hood where somebody is reneging. Not only were, were they not short, they found $300 million two different times. And last time they found a $300 million to back them, the Lori uh, Rodriguez group, was within a week after the you know, their group original. Out. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're sitting there, it's like talking about jump through hoops and like hell and high water. It, it's uh, I wonder, you wonder what I want to really say, bro. You said today's price isn't yesterday's price. I truly wonder if like um, an argument of just being like they say we got 84 Jordan. I wonder if you could take that the same way that you could take with players 
and say, like, I'm going to get an insurance policy to bet on what my future is going to be. Like, can you argue it? Like, can he really go to court and just be like, look, bro, that's why I'm not giving up the team. They say we got Mike Jordan, dog. And like this, this shit finally clicking in Minnesota. Like, no, nah, that don't work. It, it, it's almost like saying it goes the other way where team says I gave a player the super duper max, 300 million. And then find out that uh, according to other players, he may not be as good as we thought as front office folks or owners who may not know as much about basketball. And then you say, nah, I want to give him 300 million anymore. That really ain't going to fly. And so it's just going to be really, really interesting what happens next. I think, you know, the courts are going to take over here. Um, I'm assuming, you know, and it's, it's the battle of, of owners. Um, but this is, this is interesting. Uh, I mean, I think you gave me your take on Glenn Taylor's side, but what would your take be on, on, on Lori and A-Rod's side, if you're them? To be completely honest, I'd be heated, especially when it's coming down and just trying to cross over and you know, trying to make big money moves. We sat down, we had a real conversation. For one, you're saying today's price isn't yesterday's price. You argue and be like, well, we are already buying a shaky franchise who hadn't had any type of success for a billion dollars, big dog. Like, you know what I mean? Like. Mm-hmm. You literally, when we picked this bad boy up, it ain't been nothing since y'all did the Joe Smith thing and ruined, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Ruined KG's prime Mm -hmm. by losing, you know what I mean? By getting suspended. I think that's one. I think another thing that occurs is just sometimes I think that goes under this rug or even under a stip- it's just bad business practice. And I think a lot of times in the NBA, the only people that are held to a certain standard are the players. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. And, And when you're talking about the business practice, I know you just can't sit here and have a handshake agreement and then when it goes your way it doesn't go your way or you still want the team it's like we already bought the team we found 300 million dollars for the team i would i would be furious i would, I would truly be furious i didn't move to minnesota <laughs> like, yeah, like, like bro i spent the past two years in minnesota fully dog yeah but you know what i mean like almost to that point help build help use my reputation everything like regardless of which when rodriguez pulled up that done a lot for the franchise as well. True story. Like, it's no difference than like when you're going to buy a team, when you're you're able to do stuff. Like people's presence ignites a lot of fuel. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I think one thing that's just going to occur is uh, them asking for that effort back, or at least for that effort to be respected. I mean, they've been pretty locked in too. You know, I've seen yeah. them, I've seen them interact with the players. I mean, both teams at the games, court side. You know, their presence. Um, you know, really excited about it. A Rod being a minority, coming from where he come from. I mean, that's I me. Mean, these are like monumental moments when we see them, and so we pay close attention to them. Uh, but this is this is really interesting when you know you hear different sides and people try to paint a certain picture. One side saying you yeah, didn't have enough money, and so if you're the other side, you're like, wait, hold on, I've hit every benchmark, I've done everything I had to do one time, every time, and this is how you're going to paint it. And as an athlete, that's what we're used to seeing how a picture has always been painted for us. And then we, yeah. it's a lot harder to clear up a rumor than to, to just put one out there. And so now you's like, look, you putting crazy obstacles and barriers in my way. And it's, you know, the other side, it feels like, ah, well, I'm not willing to sell something I didn't know was more valuable than the price I put on in the first place. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's going to be really interesting. You know, I think a lot of folks are going to pay attention to it. Um, go this, ahead. This is my last thing I only say on it. We find it's just another piece of news. When you sit there like the like athlete or how we're trying to push the athlete, the first person that kind of got stiffed out of a franchise was who? Michael Jordan. MJ in D.C. You understand what I'm saying? And it came from the fact of, uh, like you say, based on mm-hmm. free labor in a sense of like using my presence, using all my ability, my effort. Like he played for the Wizards for free, basically. Mm-hmm. In order to build that franchise up. The second it comes down to it, somebody reneges and you just go about your business and call it a day. But it's like, no, my G, that's a, a steep violation. Shit. If there were a billionaire to billionaire, they backed out. There would be some type of hundreds of million dollar fine or whatever is occurring. So you look at that and that occurred back in like 03. And then you fast forward 20 years later, it's like not saying Rodriguez was Michael Jordan, but he's pretty much up there playing for the Yankees. And when you're coming down to it and just being like, yo, you have something I'm supposed to buy. Is it okay for the renege to occur? But at the same time, we're kind of, it's kind of, you know, messing up, pushing the needle for it. That's all I'm saying. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you said it too. Yeah. When there's a merger or a, there's an acquisition of a country of a company to to another company, there's always that you know if I'm being bought out, and at any point the sale doesn't go through, you still you owe me something for putting me through all this. I bought I bought a whole new island thinking that my company is about to get bought, and then you renege. Oh, you got to you got to pay for this island. I see that all the time. So if, you know, yeah, company's supposed to get bought off for ten billion, and then if it doesn't get bought, the, the acquiring company. Owes the company supposed to get bought nine hundred million. I see it every day. Every day, you know, whether I'm looking at the inf- information or Financial Times, there's always like uh, an opt out agreement. This is where if you don't if you don't come through your word and your word, then there are expectations because that you know pushes the deal along and make sure that it gets done. So it's getting it's getting really interesting uh, as this continues to develop, and we'll keep a close eye on it. Point. Forward. I'm here, uh, Evan Turner, with my main man, you know, James Hotkiss Jr., uh, Trippy J. Um, you know, Miami Heat, Wayne Ford, also won, uh, you know, UCLA Bruin. You know, Living Legend, one of the best rookies in the NBA today. Um, thanks for joining us today. Right now, we don't have Andre with us. He's on his way coming over. But thanks for taking your time out today to come hang out with us, Jaime. Yeah, appreciate you having me, man. Happy to be here. No doubt. I once I seen you recently. Um, where was it? At Art Basel last, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Art, yeah, we were at nope. yeah we were at that pretty cool uh, that pretty cool house. I think it was uh, that dope mansion right by the water, right? Yeah, I, I remember. Yeah. And then they had a boat there. It was uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and then I also saw you. I think uh, the night of the NBA draft. I think we bumped into each other at some yeah. like the, the <laughs> yeah after, yeah some of the after events. So it was it was so cool to see you, but you know to really follow up and see the night that. I guess exactly. when you're in the NBA, it's like it's two dates before yeah. you hit the league and right after, you yeah. know, and kind of like the transition. And I remember, uh, you know, seeing you in the club and being like, man, that's a that's a cool dude. He's bigger than what I thought. And then to see you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to see you really come out now and see who you are at this, uh, you know, in this day, you know, day and age and the reputation you have in such a prestigious uh, organization. And I just want to know, you know. Where did that start from? You know, who was Jaime, you know, Hotkiss Jr. And, you know, what got you into basketball? And tell us about your first couple, you know, first couple of years prior to, you know, superstardom. Um, man, I would say uh, I've been in love with basketball for as long as I can really remember. My dad and mom both played uh, Division Two basketball at Concordia in Irvine. That's where they met. Um, and then, you know, they had me. And then from there, my first word was ball. So I, I've always really been uh, really big into sports and particularly basketball. Um, and then, you know, growing up, being a big Laker fan, watching Kobe, he was a big inspiration for me um, and the reason why I wanted to play basketball. Um, and then, you know, I just kind of followed my dream from there. Um, you know, I had a lot of people believe in me. Uh, I told everyone I wanted to be a professional basketball player um, and no one was going to change my mind. So I kind of just took that and ran with it. Yeah, I read an article recently when they were talking about your upbringing and your dad, who was a hooper himself, he uh, came from uh, Mexico, correct? Well, his mother came, my grandmother came from Mexico. Okay. He had been great at Hilbert. And he was talking about, you know, when you were younger, he was trying to see your threshold and how much, you know, you could take. And when it came down to it, he knew uh, your drive and your passion for everything was, you know, you know, fully equipped to really try to make it to the next level. Where did that come from? And, you know, when you talk about that confidence and that tenacity, where did that come from and, and your, you know, a surefire way to know that you're going to make it to the NBA? Yeah. That's that's a hard thing to do, especially when you break down the background and numbers. Yeah. Coming from Carrillo, you know, being a Hispanic player, that's, yeah. you know, few and far between. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. I just kind of didn't listen. I guess I was ignorant to all, all those yeah. stats and kind of just put my head down and, and decided this is what I want to do. Um, and no one was going to tell me any different. Uh, and I just, you know, trusted in the work that I put in uh, from a young age, going to the gym, even after practice, before practice, uh, waking up at 6 a.m. to go to the weight room uh, with my dad before school, just all the little things and uh, all the little things that, you know, add, uh, that add up to the big things. Uh, I just really trusted in the work and knowing that, you know, there was a lot of guys uh, that I played against who people said were going to go to the NBA. And I knew I was right there with them, and I thought if these guys could go, then there's no way in hell that I can't. So that's kind of the mentality that I had. Yeah, but now you fast forward to the NBA, and you know, 
the least sexiest thing now is four-year players and, you know, having, yeah. you know, being a 22-year-old, but you're able to get drafted in the first round, but not only be able to get drafted to the first round, but, but go to a team that was a championship contender and be one of the most integral parts. How were you able to step step into the heat culture and, you know, implement your, you know, your, your impact? Um, I think, I think, you know, you know, like you said, not everyone really takes a four year guy as uh, the new hot thing in the NBA, but mm-hmm. I kind of took it as an advantage. Um, just understanding that I had a lot of experience to bring to the team, uh, playing four years, playing, you know, multiple SCA tournament games and, and learning what it took to, you know, win. And I think I, in college, you really learn that. Um, you take that to heart, especially with, you know, college coaches and how hard they are on you. You know, I think it really prepared me for, you know, what heat culture is all about. And uh, when you break down some of the things with the heat culture, what was something that really shot you from your first day? Obviously, I know you, the, the history, the background of the Pat Riley situation of, uh, you know, your dad kind of modeled the teams after, you know, the run and gun type late show situation. So mm-hmm. were you excited or were you like, oh, I'm really walking into the yeah. trenches? Because I know that that workout wasn't easy. Yeah, no, I was definitely, I was excited, extremely nervous. Um, you know, I wanted to make my workout for the Heat memorable. Um, yeah. I, I was definitely, I definitely knew what I was getting into. Uh, well, I mean, maybe not new, but I heard the rumors about how, you know, hard and intense that workout could be. Um, but I was excited for it because that's, that's what I'm all about. I think, you know, people are really made in the trenches. And that's where you find out who you really are. Um, and that's what I love. So I think, you know, me going to that situation uh, was really in my comfort zone. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad I made a great impression. You know, they drafted me. So I know I did something right in that workout. Um, and then going from there, you know, just being a part of the culture and really understanding what that means, you know, almost being done my first season. I've learned that, you know, the heat culture is no joke. Um, they're all about winning, toughness, most conditioned, most professional all that um so you know it's great it's great yeah what, what was uh what were you looking forward to most like when you first going up against uh jimmy butler i know i watched you in some of the rico hines runs mm-hmm. and i seen you like sometimes in the paul george highlights you'd be the main one guarding him even since you were in college yeah and was it like when you step on the floor you're like yo i can't wait to go at jimmy butler and you know try to mm-hmm. attack and go at the best but also learn from him it's been moments where you know early in the season you've been uh asked to step up in the fourth quarter and some of the biggest moments in the games to really, you know, clear it out. Yeah, I would say, you know, especially in the first training camp, uh, you know, just being able to go against him and, and so many other, you know, the great guys like Tyler, Bam, uh, K-Love, you know, all those guys just trying to learn from them, go up against, see where I'm at, see where I can fit among all these, you know, great players. Um, and then, you know, like you said, well, learning from them, I think, was also a very crucial part Um they played so many years in the NBA and, you know, to be able to just sit there and learn and listen, I think is also really important. And it really helped me um, and, and gave me confidence to, you know, uh, to know when that when my time was called, I was going to be ready. Yeah. So you see yourself amongst a lot of like the top uh, rookies in the league and some of like the top, uh, you know, flow of pace. Where do you think, uh, you know, not only talking about the players now, but moving forward to the guys your age, how do you see yourself continue to develop and continue to try to push the organization forward? Mm-hmm. Considering there's teams like OKC that has such a young core or even Spurs trying to really, you know, crank it up to, you know, next level. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, for the group of guys we have right now, we got a very good mix of, uh, you know, older veterans, um, you know, some mid-level vets. And then, you know, uh, a a nice group of young guys that we got. So I think we got a very um, interesting dynamic on our team with with a little bit of mix of everything. And I think, you know, with us young guys, we're just trying to learn as much as we can from, you know, the old vets, just trying to, you know, continue to push this organization forward to greatness. Um, And, uh, you know, it's a team effort. We're all trying – they're trying to teach us as much as we can, um, you know, for that time comes to where, you know, the young guys are now – you know, moving up, moving up the ladder, getting older, and then, you know, the cycle continues. No, definitely. I wanted to go back, uh, you know, obviously we have Stacy. She's a UCLA Bruin. We're in the middle of the NCAA, well, towards the end of the NCAA tournament. One thing that I uh, was a big fan of, of you about was, you know, how you and your teammates were able to get, you know, UCLA back cracking, you know, oh. even with Mick Cronin and kind of, you know, 
restore the feeling after, you know, a slow couple of years of like high, you know, high recruits and everything. Yes. Go back to what that was like kind of rebuilding and kind of implementing yourself into being one of the best, you know, players of the recent years and getting a legendary program to a Final Four. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, when I committed to UCLA, I knew I, I went there with the plan and a mission. And uh, that was to, you know, restore UCLA back to former glory. Um, you know, and I think that was not just myself. That was a collective uh, group effort of all the guys on, on my team. We all had that same mentality uh, of understanding what UCLA basketball means, what the four letters mean. Um, and we felt like it was our responsibility. We were there, you know, to try to do whatever we can to, you know, try to bring a national championship. We fell short, got to a final four, which was great. Um, but ultimately, you know, just being, making UCLA relevant, like, again, was, I think, the most important thing for us as a group, um, you know, just having people talk about us and, you know, uh, you know, really just be out there and, and put UCLA back at the forefront, I think was um, our main goal. I know it was mine when I got there. Um, so, you know, it was just great. I, I had so much fun in UCLA. I uh, was so happy and proud of, you know, my teammates and what we were able to accomplish. Yeah, you were able to pass the torch to your sister as well, right? She yeah. Was able, yeah. She's doing. She's doing good. They just unfortunately yeah. lost the Sweet Sixteen, but I mean they got a they got a good group of young girls, um, yeah. and they'll be back again next year. Yeah, she's part of like the number one recruiting class, correct? Coming out of. Yeah, I, th- yeah. I think they did have the number one recruiting class. Um, when when it was her year, she's a sophomore sophomore now, um, and yeah, I think you know they're only they're only just started, so they got a long they got a couple more years, and they'll get it done. Yeah, but she credits you for setting tons of examples. What's it like, you know, trying to be her older brother, but at the same time really, you know, kind of paving a path? You you also have, like, the whole background of, like, you know, the Mexican heritage you're just representing. But, like, when it comes closer to home and putting your family name on your back, especially with a sport that is like a family sport, what has it been like for, you know, your whole family in, in that affair? Oh, um, man, yeah, it's been a lot of travel, and that's for sure. <laughs> I know my parents and – uh, family racked up a lot of miles traveling to all our games. Um, to, but just to be able to see her do her own thing um, and really create her own path. Um, you know, I, I was a senior and she was a freshman when we were when I was at UCLA. So to be able to see her that year was cool. But now, you know, looking from afar, seeing her be her own person um, is it, really special. And, you know, I'm really proud of her, what she's been able to accomplish. Um, and, you know, she's only going to have continued success. Yeah, for sure. And we, we dove deeper into, uh, you know, the UCLA background and overall, like, um, you know, the L.A. atmosphere as a whole with the basketball community. Okay. And, uh, you know, even talking about those Rico Hines runs and the, the culture of what UCLA is in the summertime, you dive into that and, you know, what makes it such a basketball city with so much talent and, you know, the highest league in the world and how that helped mold you. Yeah, I mean, I think basketball city, I think everyone comes because it's nice weather. That's for sure. <laughs> Uh, it's great vibes in L.A. Um, you know, there's a lot to do. Uh, you know, everyone, that's where everyone just goes in the summer. Um, and, you know, being there for four years, it made it easy for me. I didn't really have to go anywhere. Everyone just came to me. And uh, being able to go playing those runs, I think, you know, myself personally, I think those are the best runs, um, you know, in, in the country and probably the world just because of the competitive nature that, you know, Rico brings. Um, to the pickup games, uh, you know, it's supposed to simulate the last, you know, three, four minutes of a game. And, you know, you really feel that when you're playing and then, you know, you lose, you have to sit. You know, it, it's just the competitive nature is just really brought out in those runs. And, you know, when you go and you see, uh, you can really feel the energy in, in the building. Um, and it's not like anywhere else. Well, when did you know you belonged out there? Because you say you're going to make it to the NBA. And, like, we you know young guys play with older dudes all the time. But there's certain moments where it's like, all right, this might be a realistic thing. Who was it when you went up against them in both the league and at the runs prior to that was, like, that led to you believing, mm-hmm. you know, averaging 13 as a rookie now, one of the top rookies in the league? Or, you know, am I Man, even that's eat? a good question. I haven't even really thought about that. Like, who was yeah. the guy that – you know, I thought, okay, now I can really do this. I mean, I don't know. I think, um, you know, growing up, I think maybe, you know, my freshman year um, or that summer uh, playing in those runs, um, I thought, you know, this is something I could really do. Um, You know, usually the UCLA guys, we all stick together on a team, uh, and that's kind of how it goes. 
Uh, so after we got a couple wins, you know, it, it was, I was like, I, I felt a lot more comfortable. And I think even my junior year in college um, or my, my summer after my junior year, going into my senior year, it was just, it was our team, UCLA Bruins, and they had a couple of pro teams in there. And I remember we were playing the Raptors because they were there. We ended up, them. yeah, we ended up beating them. And that, you know, that just shot our confidence all the way up. And, you know, we just, I, I don't know, I know myself and the rest of the guys, we just had the utmost confidence to go into that season knowing that, you know, we, we, we can hold our own against, you know, the best in the world. No, that's true. And you fast forward to now, and you're talking about the heat and being able to hold your own against the best in the world. You see the Jimmy Butler thing, like it's about that time of the year where you crank it up. It's yeah. like, ooh. How realistic is that and where you you feel like you guys are at now in regards to team trying to hit the stride and getting ready to, you know, go into April? You know, it's one thing for teams to say we're happy to make the playoffs, but the Heat really believe they're going to make the championship every year or else it's a fail. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a real thing. And I think, you know, you know, it's the truth. You know, if you're not playing to to win, then why are you playing? I think that's the mentality, you know, that I have and that we have as a team. Um, and as far as our positioning, uh, you know, we just need a chance. And I think that's, you know, kind of the mentality that we have. We don't care who we're going to play against. Um, you know, we're just going to we're going to take it to whoever that may be. Um, and as far as our position right now, I think we're in a really great position um, mentally as a team. Uh, you know, we're, we're 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 at that point right now where, you know, everything's starting to come together. You feel the intensity really picking up, um, you know, not just for us, but across the league. Uh, and how important these game, these last few regular season games are. Um, and, you know, th- this is a fun time of the year. This is where, you know, the players become players and, you know, guys either step up to the challenge or, or, or fold under the pressure. And, you know, this is this is a moment that, you know, basketball players live for. That's real. And, and one thing I love about you is, like, step up to the challenge. It's hard to hate on you because, like, obviously you have athleticism, a really? great flow of hair or whatever, <laughs> but, like, when you sit down and you say step up to the challenge, there's a there's a tenacity about you that where even you say challenge, it's like, no, until I, like, it's time to go to war. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and one thing I want to really dive back on is, like, you have a never back down type mentality. That isn't so much just not like it's – a crazy rare uh, but like what you're doing it in the environment you're doing it in and the space you're doing it in it's like no nobody you know really saw this coming it's man. just do you ever think like that or are you just like no I knew I was going to show up be a rock star the pop star is <laughs> going to ask me for photos and uh, you know what I mean I mean yeah I, I don't know I kind of just um, I don't know I kind of just stay in my own stay in my own world stay in my own lane um, and you know whoever you know, enjoys that or is a fan of that, you know, more than welcome to support. But I think I know, you know, with all the, the with all the praise, there's going to be criticism as well. So I don't really take it all to heart, you know, whether it's good or bad. I kind of just take it for what it is. And with that mentality, I think, you know, it allows me to just, you know, I don't know, not care about things that don't matter. Just worry about the things that matter and, and focus on focus on that and everything else is just secondary. So I, I don't know. I kind of, that, that's the mentality I take. Um, you know, I don't know if I thought, you know, all this is, you know, all this extra stuff will come with it, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. You got to just take it for that. Um, and, you know, keep the main thing, the main thing. And then, you know, moving forward on and off the court, where do you want to see yourself taking your brand? Because I guess like one thing to stay within yourself, but it's another thing to really play yourself and leave, uh, you know, some of these benefits on the table on top of, like, what you're trying to do off the court. Sometimes people use their platform in order for um, philanthropic work and endeavors and also to spread light. Like we said, you want to few Hispanic players to ever make it to the NBA. And, you yeah. know, where, where do you want to take that to? And, you know, what? how do you carry that torch? And, and also, too, who is – was there anybody inspired you, like, you know, Nahara or, like, anybody like that where you're like, yo, I can definitely make it? Yeah, I mean, like I said, my, my my biggest inspiration growing up was Kobe. Yeah. And, and, you know, as far as, you know, like that torch and, you know, what I'm representing, I, I think, you know, my goal is to just spread the game of basketball, you know, and, and try to take it, you know, as worldwide as I possibly can. I mean, I know it's already grown worldwide. 
but you know even more especially you know down to mexico and south america um you know where there's the towel level it, it, it is is very high but you know there isn't much opportunity or access um to you know the resources that they need to be able to you know learn the game of basketball and really fall in love with it because you know now uh, a lot of south america and mexico is is a lot of soccer and baseball and you know my goal is to try to you know bring the sport that i love down there and, and show you know kids down there you know hey try this out and and look at what it can do for you as well and that's kind of the mentality that i take and you know, just try to grow that sport as best I can and show people the game that I love and, and, and show how much it can help, um, you know, help communities and, um, you know, just be because basketball, that's what it is. Everyone comes together to watch basketball games. It's a really community based sport. You know, you root for your teams and, you know, there's a lot of love that comes with that. And so that's that that's really what I'm trying to do. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. I also want to, um, you know, one last thing when it comes to time to like the next level when you're talking about the youth because I think you kind of trump these conversations as a lot of people being like sometimes our guys don't compete enough and sometimes you know our younger guys don't take it serious what is there something that you can really say for the next generation or even if Dre was here to be he'll, he'll tell you you got to leave the game better than when you found it how can you really say it to, what can you say to really trump the negativity around like the youth and their efforts but yeah. also kind of challenge your environment and those who are coming out with you well this is the one thing i'll always say about you know older people talking about the youth <laughs> 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 this is one thing yeah well because right. this is this is always the you know approach and mentality that i took I, you know we are the youth but you are the elders that raised us you know what i'm saying so as much as you know you want to take responsibility i think you know, there's a lot of responsibility on, on both sides because as much as, you know, people are going to hate on youth for you saying not try hard. Well, you know, you guys are the ones that raise us to be this way. So, I mean, that's kind of the mentality that I take. But at the same time, I think, you know, the, the game grows and it, it evolves in so many different ways, you know, for better and for worse. You know, you can see it as one way. Um, the game is growing, all the opportunity. You got NIL, high school, there's all these people making money. You know, that's what you know, the older generation was fighting for it, was for, for those opportunities. And now you see, you know, the, the youth reaping those benefits. And, you know, I think there's a lot of ways that it could be done better um, and, and really focus on the game. But, you know, it's a give and take. There, there, there's going to be trials and tribulations. Um, you know, you know, some people, you know, take it, take the game of basketball and use it in ways that it shouldn't be used. And some people, you know, really love the game and give it all. And, you know, they, they get it back. And I think, you know, with the use, I think, you know, it's only going to grow and evolve. And, you know, it's going to it's going to it's going to be a group effort with, you know, the whole entire basketball community to try to, you know, preserve um, the integrity of the basketball game. So I think it's a group effort all in all. Um, and I think as time goes on, we're going to see, you know, things change and things evolve and, you know, regulations for, you know, how, you know, I don't know how high school players, college players are getting paid now. It really changes the game, and it does, for better and for worse. So, I mean, it really depends on how you look at it. Um, and I think as a collective of, you know, basketball players like ourselves, you know, it's our job to try to push it in the right direction or guide it in a way where, you know, everyone can benefit um, and, you know, still keep the integrity of the game. Absolutely. I, I love you saying that. Uh, last question, uh, or actually, you know, one of the last questions before we get out of here. I forgot who we were interviewing, and obviously discussing the All Star Weekend and who can save it. But we saw s one of our guests was saying, "Yo, we need how many hotkeys in the dunk contest?" Oh man, who, who was that? Who, who was I, I, we were trying to figure out who said it, but your, your name it came up a couple times, and I was like, "Yo, I've seen this dunk contest from high school. It's actually crazy." Yeah, you know what I mean. That was that was a fun one. That was a fun one. <laughs> yeah, do you, do you see yourself ever, you know, trying to, you know, continue to try to participate in that type of atmosphere? You think you can uh, make it at this level? I'm retired, man. I'm retiring. <laughs> I'm retiring from my dunk contest. After I did, you know, this last one, you know, that was kind of my goal. You know, I was kind of, you know, whatever happens, happens. But after this one, I'm hanging up my dunking shoes and uh, put it to rest. I'm, I'm retired. Yeah. And then uh, last question. You signed a Jordan brand, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's 
<laughs> their roster is crazy. I mean, I looked at the highlight. Uh, I looked at the, you know, when you're on the page with Luca and all them guys and everything. And uh, what's yeah. that about? Like, well, how'd you feel when Jordan reached out? You know, you're a Kobe guy, but are you familiar with Jordan and legacy that he left, obviously, and, you know, yeah. or, or is it just pro Kobe? No, nah, I mean, I'm very familiar with, you know, the legacy um, and greatness that Michael Jordan left behind. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm a Kobe guy. That's not to say I'm not a huge fan of Michael Jordan as well. Um, but I think it's one of those things like, you know, when you get the call uh, that Jordan brand wants to sign you, that's one of those things you just can't say no. You know, yeah, you get that guy who wants you to be a part of his brand. It's kind of like a no brainer. Um, you know, you have a guy like that believing in you. I mean, you know, that just allowed I, that, that was honestly a part of my confidence is, you know, all right, Jordan wants to sign me. Not, nothing's going to stop him now. Like, if you get his stamp of approval, I feel like, you know, you're doing something. Right. Yeah, between Jordan, uh, Pat Riley, and Eric Spolstra, and then with Jimmy Butler and Bam and <laughs> I think I think you're on your way, man. So yeah, appreciate. It. Once again, man, thank you for uh, you know taking your time, you know jumping on a pod with us. We're gonna have to do this again when Dre's yeah, back. For sure, he's hailing the union, trying to make sure y'all get more money and uh, you know spread appreciate the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. So once again, man, big fan. Keep doing your thing, and uh, like thank I said, you. man, I always respect how you carried yourself. Appreciate I was telling it. our producer earlier. I was like, I saw him at the club last year, and um. We actually bumped into each other and he had familiarity. You know what yeah. I mean? And it's one thing for people to be like, oh, I know it is. You just walk by and say, <laughs> that old head. Yeah. But it's another thing to really say what type. It was not shocking me what type of success you had yeah. based on what type of person you are. So appreciate I appreciate you, bro. Keep staying the same and uh, keep, ball- keep doing your thing, dog. I will. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. Love, bro. Love, man. Point forward. What's up, y'all? We're back with another installment of Money Moves. Presented by us, Point Four and Art Invest, the great folks down in the New Bay, Tampa Bay, Kathy Wood, uh, who has been so gracious and, as to uh, you know want to expand financial literacy uh, through our platform and through their platform as we're collaborating. Um, this week, we will be talking about the basics of budgeting and controlling your financial future. Uh, just really quick before we get into a few examples of things that we've done throughout our time as athletes, uh, you know, depending on what background you come from, uh, whether you consider wealth, rich or wealthy, um, or just trying to, uh, you know, be smarter with how your money uh, is saved and is used. Uh, so we'll talk about how to create a and manage a budget, including some tips for tracking expenses and saving. Essentially, uh, some budgeting fundamentals uh, budgeting is about understanding your income and expenses, uh, enabling you to plan and control your financial future. Um, it's really important to uh, set priorities as well, um, you know, helping you distinguish between wants and needs. And it is a great book that explains it all. Uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which has like been sold for decades and decades and makes uh, defines assets and liabilities. And it says basics as they come and so easy, even a caveman can do it. Um, I don't know why that guy code just came to mind, but essentially that's what it is. Um, and it helps you really focus spending on what truly matters. And I would say adaptability as well. You know, regularly updating your budget, ensuring that you can adopt to your life changes. You know, whether you lose a job or you get a raise, uh, promotion and keeping you on track to meet your financial goals. And so um, as we get into that ET, what has been your understanding of budgeting? You know, how, what was budgeting like in college? I think that's where we should start because people don't know there was no NIL. And so that little $900 a semester had to go a long way. <laughs> Man, it was literally saying no to a lot. I mean, that was, that was an understatement. It wasn't like a shoe budget. It wasn't like a nothing budget, it was like, what do I have for like trying to figure out my cell phone bill, trying to figure out, you know what I mean? Just pocket changes, having pocket money on me. Obviously, when I first left the dorms, uh, we were able to get, I think $1,300 a month mm-hmm. for uh, scholarship money. So one thing I had to understand was, all right, what was my rent and utility? So rent 
was like 450. Shout out to Owen Tangy Commons. Shout out to John Diebler. And usually utilities was like $150. You feel what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So when we sit right there, bust it. That's 600. You know what I mean? I'm already <laughs> going. That's 600. So now when you go, shout out to my auntie Kenny G, because she, she got me a truck after I started whining. I'm like, I deserve somebody got to buy me a car so I get to the gym. Like, I don't give a fuck who would do, but I'm right. like, I can't walk anymore. She co- she took care of the, like the insurance and everything like that. So once it started getting done, and I realized, uh, obviously, I was like kind of wow. helping my brother out too with like some of my bread and shit. So I knew for sure each month or whatever, I had to make sure I put aside like eight hundred for my you know responsibilities and everything. Mm-hmm. I had like, and this was back in the day where I actually was like big on saving. I actually <laughs> saved like 200 a month in like my own savings account. Nice. And everything else I just pretty much used to like somewhat play with and, you know, spend money on food, spend money, you know, every blue moon I might go cop some more t-shirts or some jeans or something like that. But for sure each month I, I was well aware that like eight, $800, $900 was already put to the side. And I was big on just making sure when I was a kid, I was so much uh, more wary. I, I really just believed in, you know, putting some dollars aside and making sure I had something going just for, you know, uh, uh, shit, just a rainy day. No, that's, that's big facts. I think for me. Yeah. And, and then clearly you had to, with the, with the rest of the money, you had to really budget in what your, what your groceries, what you're going to eat, mm-hmm. how you're able to eat. So like certain nights, certain days, I would look at the schedule and be like, all right, we might have six games this month. And say like on average, I knew for sure the average meal in you know Columbus was like twelve bucks back then. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So I knew at least on game day, I knew for sure I was going to be able to save an extra like thirty six dollars if I just ate what the team was going to give. Me. True. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like it was starting to become a cheat code like that. And then I remember you know kind of using those little things to move up, almost to the point where we would do what we did in the league, and a lot of people would try to save their per diem. Right. So, I mean, I went from saving on a small scale to being like, all right, let me save my per diem. They say by the time the per diem is done, at the end of the year, it should be like $12,500. So after you take that, I was able to save my per diem. I was able to save like some of my money per month. And at the end of the year, people don't know I bought my first gold Rolex. It was half from per diem, per diem money. Oh, that's and then half from like, yeah, just putting like little bread from the side that I was getting allowance for it. You know what I mean? I think for me. What about, what about you? How did you, what's your budgeting like back then when you first started to obviously like today and what, what really went into, uh, you know, you figuring out what, what was needed per month? Like, was there any obligations back home? Was there any obligations for like something aside from basketball, mm-hmm. like afterwards, like were you seeing things like for the future? So in, in college, I wasn't thinking about the future. For me, it was just, I would break down my monthly uh, allowance from, you know, whether, uh, you know, living in dorms, it wasn't much because you, you didn't have any responsibilities. But when I moved out, like you said, I might have got 900 a month, maybe, maybe. And a certain amount went to rent, a certain amount, you know, for food, a certain amount. Obviously, I wanted a pair of shoes or two or three. It all depended on, you know, what it was like. So I was really budgeting for shoes. That's be- that was basically until I got to the league. Yeah. Uh, but the big thing for me was like I was budgeting by the week. And so if I got 900, I'm dividing it by four. So like into each week, I'm seeing like, all right, how much money do I have left? You know, so basically I'm at like 200 and what $25, 200. I'm at two, yeah, two, yeah, 20, 225. 225 a week. And so, <laughs> um, but then obviously I would take out my, uh, rent, which brought it down smaller. And then, like you said, like small tricks, like finesse and like, all right, where can I get the meal that I want for the cheapest? So like Chipotle became the spot. Then I would, if we won, I knew I can get a free burrito at Chipotle. So that would help me out, you know, and then like certain spots I could finesse. And, and then we had a uh, team meals. I knew I can finesse around. So like it was about a week, but I didn't want to be zeroed out by the end of the month. And so if I can save a hundred dollars by the end of the <laughs> month, I was like, all right, cool. I can roll this over. But as soon as the next roll, month rolled over, I spent that hundred on something I really wanted. There was a pair of Jordans. As you know, Jordans, you can get a pair of Jordans for the Lolo at the outlet store. So I would do that. Just a little yeah. goofy stuff like that. And then it's funny because budgeting in the league, you know, you hear so many horror stories, but a good 
thing that happened to me was that I didn't know where to get expensive stuff for like my first year in the league. Like I didn't know where Louis yep. was at. Like I was in the gym. I was a rookie. I was tied up doing like rookie duties and it, it was good for me. I really didn't know where to go in each city, you know, and I was the youngest guy by far. Like Kyle Cobra was like the closest to me and he did like five years in college. So we four years apart still, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I really wasn't hanging out with anybody like that. So I wasn't going shopping. I mean, I'm blaming you and Lou Will because then I got somebody to hang out with and now we're going out. But I didn't know where to go shopping. So my financial advisors at that time were very, very like, please would be like, man, we don't have any worries with you. Like, you're going to save all your money. Like, he's like, I got a guy, yeah. another team. His teammates keep selling him his old car. He's like, I hate this guy. I hate him because he, he buys a new car and then decides to sell his old car to the rookie who's telling him he's giving him a deal. And so that helped me in terms of like, now I start understanding. Uh, I had an amazing conversation one day with Elton Brand where uh, I'll, I'll break down in another episode where when Elvin Brand kind of sparked this thought in my mind on compound interest, that's when I learned like budgeting now because I'm saving my money up for later where the compound, the interest alone will take care of all my wants and needs. And so it's like, why? it's like, you know, you pushing off instant gratification. You're just delaying it for later. And then by the time you get there, you realize like, ah, I really didn't want it. So it's like the things you really want, you can wait on. And the things you don't <laughs> want when you wait on them, you really you realize you don't need them. Yeah, that's right. I remember I used that story. Uh, I remember I was going into like my fifth year in the league, so I'm like, man, I want to buy. Uh, so I want to buy a rape. You know what I mean? So I'm. It's like my last year in Boston. I'm financially straight. I was still like pretty much saving up, like pretty for one most part. And I remember, uh, I remember like getting ready to say, maybe I'll buy it. And I'm like, all right, I got six more months for my contract year. You know what I mean? So I was like, let me just be responsible and be like, all right, bro, I'm going to go absolutely crazy. Like, I'm going to go dumb. Almost to the point where it makes sense I can buy the rate. So mm-hmm. like as opposed to buying it that September of like 2015, I just put my head down, worked, and was just like, all right, not saying it like this is the way I'll say but I'm like, I'm going to bring in a lot more. And by the time July of 2016 hit, I bought a rate. And when I look back on it, I had the car for like six or seven years. Loved the car to death. But then when I break it down, it was like the ticket for the rate was like three forty four or like no four hundred. My mom's house in Ohio, which it was parked in the driveway, was three forty four. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so when you sit there, I was like, oh, this is this is the only time you can do shit like this. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But during that time, like, bro, this is this is dumb. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so now I don't have a house. Talk about hood rich. Yes. Yes. I have a, a very interesting story uh, from Springfield, Illinois. I'll keep all names out of this, but a certain police officer was jealous of a family member and he wrote on a Facebook message board. Uh, I know who this guy is because uh, I always see a $500,000 car outside of a $60,000 house. I know who it is. <laughs> but he was jealous, jealous of this person. This was a police officer on message boards, jealous of, of certain folks. And, and yeah, it was pretty yeah, funny. I, and so that's that's no. what I always try to explain to people. This is a part of like budgeting too. And so I always feel like, you know, the things that you want, they should, they should match, you know, some of your needs and some of your, uh, you know, the lifestyle you live. So if you got to, you know, like my favorite car at one point was a Maybach. And I was, somebody was like, why wouldn't you get one? A coach was like, you can buy that. I'm like, no, because I got to have a house. And then if you got a Maybach, you probably should have a helicopter. If you got a helicopter, you got to have a private yeah. plane. And then I got to have a chauffeur. And then if you got a chauffeur, you probably should have a butler. If you got a butler, then you should have a uh, yeah. living, you know, like maids and, and, you know, all that stuff. It has to make sense. And so, and then it has to match like how you live and how you move around it. And it's all it's all about saving time. And so that's when time is money. Money is time. You have to pull back later to really understand, like, what is time and how is time valuable to you? So you watch shows like um, Succession or Billions and how certain people are moving around and, you know, uh, media conglomerates. It's like most of the time people fly in private because it saves them time. And, you know, they have to be at places a certain. And it's like that's just they're moving on this crazy schedule. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I think like preparation is everything too when it's coming to budgeting and just know it. Like, it allows you to get your no ready. 
Uh-huh. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I think a lot of times yeah. people don't budget because they're not uh-huh. too much or they, they end up short in money because they didn't do their budgeting. So when you sit there, they're like, well, shit, it's not like a, it's not like you're dumb because you're out of your money by like the second week. It's just like, if you knew better, you do better. So I'm pretty sure I would like to think you would have went out had you had known you only had $87 worth of wiggle room and now you're negative 200 in the blue. You feel what I'm saying? I and I think, think you would have liked up. to know. I like that. I like it. So bar, that's a yeah, bar. Like, I would think yeah, you would have known. Yeah, because when you sit there, people are like, no, nah, like he dumb. I was like, no, he just wasn't thinking. Because I think if he would have known, he wouldn't have done this dumb shit. You understand what I'm saying? And it's like, it comes back to if you knew better, you do better. Yeah. So when I be sitting there, it's just like, nah, bro, like, like we said last week, just know yourself and know what's yeah. going on. Because once you know that, you're well equipped to hit the field. I'm like, bro, I'm not doing that shit. Right. Like, no, I'm not doing this. Like, Nah, what? Who all over there? I'm like, nah, that's a group that that, <laughs> that be arguing with the bill. I don't got an extra ten dollars. Like, right. you understand what I'm saying? Right. And it's like you comprehend yeah. your L's before yeah. you go out throughout the day. It's like, yeah. uh, if y'all want an example of budgeting? Go look at Half Baked when Dave Chappelle took Mary Jane on that date. You understand what I'm mm-hmm. saying? That the buddy took her all around New York for like seventy seven dollars and twenty seven cents. And Hot made dog, it work. yeah, ice cream. And from all that pro, you know, being proactive, he got the cheeks, man. So think about it like that. When you save your money and you proactive, you're going to get the cheeks. Now, I know that's what y'all really doing it for. I really have to show you this uh, Instagram account that I found. I think I lost it because I didn't like the name of it. But it was on point. It's like, what's your goal? End of the day. Like, really, like, what's your goal? What are you trying to get to? And everyone's going to say, like, I want a big house. I want this type of car. It's like, no, what do you really want and why? You define mm-hmm. it all. And it's like, can you realistically get there? Then you just work back from there. All right, how much money do I need to get there? What type of job do I need to get there? What type of knowledge do I need to get this job? You know, uh, what's in my way? How do I get around it? It's just like, you really just got to um, really think long and hard about where it is that you want out of yourself and just go achieve it. And then it's a lot of discipline. Um, it's a lot of sacrifice, but it'll tell you if you really want it or if you really deserve it. Cause I always talk to, you know, my kids, I tell my kids it's this all the time. And, uh, the big <laughs> point of it is, you know, not buying something because people think it's cool. You buying it because you appreciate it and how it was built. And when you work hard and you buy something, you appreciate it. It means a lot more than buying something just because other people think it's cool. Um, so to recap, prioritize savings. Tree savings as a non-negotiable expense to ensure you're consistently building your emergency fund and working towards other financial goals. Be flexible. Be prepared to adjust your budget as your financial situation changes. And use tools that fit your lifestyle, whether it's apps, spreadsheets, or just pen and paper. You know, I saw my mother balancing her checkbook as a kid, so I was able to like see what she was doing. Uh, or using the budget tools that you're most likely to stick with to help you uh, stay in line with where you're trying to go. So, uh, you know, big picture, always remember the key to successful budgeting is discipline. We're doing it for yourself, not for other people. And so stick to those things and hopefully you'll be in a much better financial situation. Point forward. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Point Forward. Don't forget to follow Point Forward on all social media and subscribe to sh- the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. Mm-hmm.